So um, now I'm in the um, position of introducing our next um, in conversation, and that is between uh, myself um, as the interviewer with our um, very prestigious interviewee, uh, Professor Anne-Marie Gertz, who's at the Global uh, Centre for Global Affairs at New York University. This was going to be a live event, um, but we realised the other day that the weather um, was looking very bad in New York, that uh, blizzards were predicted, and Anne-Marie uh, was in the midst of needing to travel home from teaching in New York to um, her place of residence, and we were worried we might have just um, not been able to make it in terms of our timing. So we did a pre-record the other day and uh, it's my great pleasure to be able to speak to Anne-Marie, such a distinguished academic and also someone who's had a very long um, career within the UN system. So really understands uh, the interconnections between thinking about the issues we talk about in a theoretical way, but having that real depth of experience on the ground, being able to watch the political machinations as they happen in real time, and to try and untangle and make sense of those in her academic work. So uh, here we are having a conversation, Anne-Marie, Gertz and I. Thank you. We're hugely grateful to have you with us today to um, share your knowledge and experience, Anne-Marie, and welcome. Thank you. It's such a pleasure. Such, I wish I could be there in person. Yeah, we wish you could too, and um, sometime in the near future, we hope. Um, so we have been discussing already today a lot about the, the Beijing conference and reflecting on the past and what was achieved then. And I want to now turn to our experience of the now and the contemporary period, because um, as you've written quite extensively, um, things have really uh, taken a turn um, in a very different direction from the sort of trajectory that we're experiencing at Beijing. And I'm wondering if you could reflect a little for us on what you think the, um, the current uh, geopolitics are of promoting gender equality through multilateral forums. What are you seeing in terms of major drivers of um, cons the conservative turn, if you like, and who those main players are? Okay, great. Um, well, like I said, it's a delight to be here and um, just wonderful that you're keeping the spirit of Beijing alive. Um, this must be one of the last Beijing Plus 25 conferences of 2020. Um, but the subject remains incredibly important. Why was it possible to move so far so fast then? Why is it now that um, transnational feminists actually are avoiding the idea of multilateral discussions, uh, big summits on women's rights? Um, so in terms of the current, I, I know you've discussed this at, at length, um, you know, some of the things that are different, but in terms of the current geopolitics, I suppose what's going on isn't necessarily new. It's because as we've known, the Holy See has been working hard to counter mobilize on women's rights ever since Vienna, certainly Cairo and definitely Beijing. Um, it's, it's a combination of factors geopolitically, I think, that um, are, are making what was formerly almost a loony fringe um, more mainstream. And that also goes for domestic politics in many of our countries where you had a far right loony fringe, which is now much more mainstream. Mm -hmm. So internationally, um, the, the three factors that are kind of adding up into um, or had added up to a perfect storm of assault on women's rights in the past few years. Um, one is the longstanding patient mobilization of the Holy See and the fact that it has um, a position that it doesn't deserve at the UN as an observer. Um, no other major religious group has that kind of um, presence. The second is, of course, the fact that um, states that could formally be counted on to at least rhetorically support women's rights have experienced an incredible counter mobilization, a misogynist backlash linked to pronatalism. Um, and that those are, of course, the former socialist states, many of them 
uh, mobilizing against women's rights. So in 2012, Belarus at Russia's urging uh, organized a group of friends of the family at the UN. Um, and I was able to find actually through looking at some of the meetings that they've had over the past couple of years that some of the uh, Pence appointees in the US uh, administration now, some of the uh, really strong evangelicals that are rolling back women's rights in health and human services and in education, they actually were participating in the meetings of this group and they have been for some time. And then I guess the, um, the third and, and kind of really critical factor is some of the biggest friends of women's rights, even if they're not constant friends, but some of the most important voices for um, for women's rights, notably um, the US, um, had, a, had a dramatic turn against women's rights. So um, the US since 2016 uh, abdicated quite a lot of its leadership functions on women's rights at the UN, for example, holding what's called holding the pen in the Security Council on the matter of sexual violence, for example, in conflict and many, many other areas. So each of these developments brought with them a string of, has, has brought with the, have brought with them a string of countries and alliances, both with, both with countries and also um, non-governmental organizations. Um, and these um, have really come together focusing on forums that they never really were terribly interested in necessarily before. So not just the Commission on the Status of Women, but also a whole series of kind of more almost, you know, logistical uh, bureaucratic discussions internationally on, on uh, renewing resolutions, even in areas of um, uh, non-proliferation, health, and so on. So a really quite strikingly strategic, concerted, organized counter-mobilization um, that has focused on a couple of really big symbolic um, uh, attacks on the word gender, of course, um, on the idea of fundamental rights as opposed to women's rights, um, and um, on the idea of, um, you know, supporting or, or reviving the family, uh, a conventional notion of the family. That's, that's so interesting. Um, and, and just as an aside to that, are, are you seeing the way that these um, conservative forces, I suppose states as as well as non-government organisations, mirroring what the international women's movement had done? Are they, are they sort of following the similar tactics, do you think? Um, because we know that the women's movement did get very involved in those micro conversations, realising that the devil's in the detail, if you like, yeah. and, and how powerful it can be to um, get the right resolution and provisions, say in the Rome Statute for the International Criminal Court, for instance, that really drill down into the detail. So do you think this is a, a, a mirroring, if you like, of what, what went before? Um, well, maybe, I mean, certainly there's a lot of thinking and research that is going into this. So. Um, I think it's the um, I think it's the Family Research Center, which is one of the many Catholic um, family revivalist organizations. Um, actually, it's not Catholic. I think it's evangelical. Sorry, I may be wrong. Um, but they, for example, issued a couple of years ago an 80-page negotiation document that explains to its adherents how to argue. Um, on specific points, why gender as a word and a concept is such a bad thing. It's about the deconstruction of women and so on. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of research that goes into it and a lot of funding. Um, and then also, um, you know, in terms of mirroring feminist tactics, it is kind of striking that um, when you go for, to side events at the CSW, not that one has been lately, but when you go to side events at the CSW, there is a packing of the room with intelligent, animated young people, all of whom are ferociously, feverishly anti-abortion. Many of them are university students from uh, parts of the US, but all over Latin America and also parts of Europe who have been brought in by conservative NGOs and states, well, maybe not states, but conservative NGOs to support their position. So in terms of mirroring feminist tactics, yes, attention to detail, drilling right down to the bottom of documents to, to address the detail. And secondly, sort of formulating all of this as a positive culture. 
yes. a positive culture that appeals to youth and that makes sense mm. to young people. So actually in that sense, there might be some, some mirroring, which is, which is making it a little bit harder to fight actually. Yeah, that's fascinating. And also building the next generation who is supportive of these conservative moves. So yeah. that's potentially, you know, a signal to us that we need to to, to stay on top of these developments. Um, we've, we've had a little bit of a chat around this, but, you know, you've mentioned a number of countries, the um, post-Soviet countries that um, and, and then key non-state actors like the Vatican. Can you talk a little bit about China? Because it's not, um, you know, we know that it's 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 a, a rising power, obviously, um, that its its uh, international reach is uh, really developing. And uh, you mentioned something really interesting about its Belt and Road strategy, which um, I realise has all sorts of human rights implications. But just in relation to the gender gender element, it'd be interesting to hear your sure. take on that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, sure. I mean, China has a really potentially very interesting role to play because it hosted the Beijing conference. And for many years, it's been very proud of that achievement and it stood up for the platform for action. It doesn't want to see it attacked or, or derided. Um, and so, well, you know, China is on the Security Council. I've actually found I found in the past China much easier to work with than Russia on the Security Council. For a start, they would take my meetings that I requested, which is, you know, Russia never would ever. Um, but, but um, you know, China was often just very reasonable. Um, you know, if this is what the council wants, if this makes sense to the council, okay, we would rather see this peace and security, women peace and security issue in the general assembly, but fine. Um, so there has been a change and it is part of the kind of uh, polarization in the council and the standoff and China's closeness to Russia, of course, and as well as China's resistance to any scrutiny of its own internal human rights um, problems. Um, but where we see something really interesting happening, I think, is China's relationship to uh, conflict and affected and fragile states in its immediate neighborhood. And I've uh, written a paper on this with Rob Jenkins, um, raising concerns about this, because what, what China does to a country like, um, or for a country like Sri Lanka, is um, China offers an alternative to um, liberal peace building. So Sri Lanka has been asked, uh, and in fact, for a while it co-sponsored a human rights council resolution, you know more about this than me, um, calling for transitional justice, for reparations, for um, a, a, some kind of complementarity to address um, war crimes. Um, and, uh, um, uh, Sri Lanka agreed to co-sponsor this resolution after the election of Sri Sena in 2015, which was a change from the kind of more right-wing government of Rajapaksa, um, which had uh, presided over a violent, extremely a, a horrifying end to the war. Um, Rajapaksa is back in power, but even before he came back in power um, and before he left power in 2015, China was there for him. China was there with extremely liberally splashed, maybe I shouldn't use that word, but, you know, um, with, with, with loans, readily available loans for major infrastructure projects, which, of course, in a post-conflict situation, try, you know, sort of herald a new era, um, built, building um, uh, airports and seaports and so on. Um, and so basically, China offers Sri Lanka a little bit of an alternative. It's easy money. And uh, you don't have to have reparations and you don't have to uh, say where the missing persons went and so on. Yeah. Um, so um, as, as you all probably know, Sri Lanka has recently dropped its co-sponsorship of, of the Human Rights Council resolution. It's dropped its commitments or it's um, hedged heavily on its commitments on the Office of Missing Persons and the Office of Reparations. Um, and uh, it also is in a weird position now vis-a-vis -vis China because it can't repay its loans. It's gotten into so much debt with China that it's had to hand over the management of its big deep sea port in the south of the country to China for 99 years. So mm -hmm. China can now park submarines there. 
mm. on its Belt and Road. So it's got a military base there. So, I mean, that's a really dramatic example of an illiberal wave that's been permitted by Chinese support. Mm. But I think you could probably um, see similar things in Myanmar, Cambodia, for sure, um, and a couple of other places. Um, the Philippines is always a little bit um, ambivalent uh, mm. about, about China and, and you know, plays it very carefully. But um, what we are seeing now in the council is um, China kind of siding with the um, more overtly, I suppose, and with the more illiberal approaches. Mm. Um, and this is to me a shame because on human, on, well, on women's rights, China was able maybe not to sort of get into some of the deeper challenges to patriarchy um, embedded in the platform for action. But, you know, it, at least it was on side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's very important as a, as a key power at mm -hmm. the P5, absolutely. Um, while we're on the Security Council in particular, I'm just wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what's happened there lately. Um, we have heard from Christine Chinkin earlier today and, and Hilary Charlesworth and obviously others really um, expert in the women, peace and security agenda. Um, but we know that that's a bit of a uh, canary in a coal mine, if you like, sort of telling us what's going on uh, in terms of support for the women, peace and security agenda and what's happened in recent negotiations over that mm -hmm. to sort of highlight an example of this politics playing out at the UN. Okay, so um, well, Christine, Christine may have covered this, but last year the, there were two attempts in the Security Council to push the normative needle, needle on women, peace and security. Germany in April last year introduced a huge resolution um, that was a survivor-centered approach to looking at uh, preventing sexual violence and conflict. Um, the text is really great, actually, there, at least the first draft. It was really interesting and strong and kind of very much centered. Um, the entire approach to addressing sexual violence and conflict centered it on women's agency. Um, uh, really interesting. Of course, very predictably, the United States made it clear that it would not tolerate um, any mention of reproductive, uh, sexual and reproductive health, let alone rights, um, and threatened to veto the resolution if there were any such mention. Mm -hmm. um, the, the resolution had called for um, victims of sexual violence to have the uh, opportunity to terminate pregnancies if they were had been made pregnant and wished to do so. Um, so the resolution was watered down and passed um, with, uh, you know, by satisfying the Americans and getting rid of this mention. Um, the the resolution though does have some sneaky kind of good language i don't know how it got past the censors um so although the the section on on reproductive health care was removed there is a reference to the need for any care that a victim might require with, without discrimination so i suppose that leaves uh it open but there's also a really interesting paragraph on children born of rape and a call for more work on this area um, and right in the right at the beginning of the paragraph, it says, you know, for women who've been made pregnant because of rape and who choose to become mothers. Mm. That's really interesting. That's like pro-choice language that snuck in there. And I don't I don't quite know how. Um, so anyway, that was the first experience. And the second one was uh, more brutal South Africa, which was the president of the council in October 2019, uh, proposed a resolution which became 2493 which was intended to be a reassertion of the participation and leadership aspects of 1325. Again, this was you know, watered down, uh, not just by the US, but also Russia. A lot of the um, language on, on leadership and, and doing something about uh, participation and so on was, was watered down. The, the resulting resolution is really lame, actually. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, uh, it, it actually is pretty irritating because it shows how easily the women's rights agenda can become subject to kind of like just almost vanity projects of member states who want to virtue signal um, by, by passing these uh, not very strong resolutions. And, you know, it, 
it, it doesn't do anything. It just reasserts. Now, uh, a lot of people are going to disagree with me, but I think um, what happened this year in the Security Council in October when Russia, for the first time, how did they get away with this for 20 years? For the first time in 20 years, they're the president of the council. So the, you know, the lottery finally got them there on the 20th anniversary, which would have been an occasion for a huge, uh, you know, again, norm pushing um, resolution. Uh, Russia dutifully produced a, a resolution which was no more or less anodyne and bland than the South African resolution. It anticipated that the Americans weren't going to support reproductive health services, and so there's nothing there about that. It's actually, all it does is reproduce pa past language, and it reproduces some of the blandest of past language. But there's no rule that says that if you have a bland resolution, it undermines all the others. It's yeah. just a lost opportunity. Yeah. And it's a vanity resolution. Anyway, um, there was a, a huge amount of kind of ganging up on Russia and saying this is absolutely terrible. It's rolling back the women's agenda. And I don't actually see how it does. And then Russia uh, got embarrassed and uh, were unable to pass their resolution. Everybody abstained except for China, Indonesia, Vietnam, and one other country. Um, Russia produced a very interesting, I'm going to read it quickly, a very interesting explanation of vote. Um, asking why would members of the Security Council not support this? The answer is obvious. There was no genuine will to compromise. Then they ask, is there another Security Council resolution where these countries would like to see a compendium of their favorite paragraphs from previous resolutions verbatim? No. Was the approach the same when we negotiated two resolutions on women, peace and security in 2019? No. Why was it different this year? The answer is obvious. Delegations have issues with Russia in particular having the lead on this topic and challenging some states' monopoly on the issue of women in situations of armed conflict. So, you know, I'm not going to say for a second that Russia's intentions are good in relation to feminist issues. They are so not. <laughs> Russia is so not an ally in any way. But what's the point of alienating them when they're just passing a vanity resolution which is as flat as the South African one? So I thought it was a known goal, actually. I thought that um, uh, it, it was, uh, I don't think Russia is ever gonna be an ally, but I didn't think it need, we need to make them more of an enemy. Yeah, yeah. That's a fascinating story, isn't it? And, and does add more nuance to that um, geopolitics and what's going on there and how how hard it is to get your head around it all unless you're watching it as closely as you are. Um, you mentioned earlier to me too about other own goals and um, and as we were saying, the, these sort of rollbacks aren't just uh, the result of, of state action, but um, there are some own goals that are coming from the, the women's movement as well, in your view. And I'm just wondering if you could reflect a little bit on that for us and give us sure. a sense of where you think the internal um, political challenges are for the international women's movement right now too. Yeah. Um, so um, what's got me thinking about this more than anything is the fact that here in the US, the Biden-Harris administration is still not sworn in and already um, different parts of the Democratic Party are fighting, in, there's infighting, there's criticism of Biden's cabinet picks and so on. And it is really striking that the anti-women's, so I'm just thinking about conservative coalitions and how well they're able to cooperate when there's an emergency. And um, the anti-women's rights coalition internationally, it makes no sense at all. They have nothing in common, but they get along just fine when it comes to norm spoiling. And you know they don't even need a positive agenda because the destructive agenda works and makes them happy and it's easy to do. Yeah. Um, so, so, you know, for the transnational feminist movement, um, we have desperately urgent work to do and um, have to work together. Um, and I, I don't in any way want to say that we shouldn't have internal debate and we shouldn't disagree. We really should. 
Um, and in fact, some in some ways, political correctness and the idea of safe space has undermined our capacity to talk to each other across our differences. Um, so in terms of things that are really dividing the women's movement and that actually are making it easy for conservatives to pick us off, there's at least two areas that are enormously difficult. Well, there's more than two, but sex work and how we think about sex work and mobilize around trafficking. Mm -hmm. um, is one big area where there's huge divisions amongst women's movements and, you know, huge parts of the women's movement, big, big parts that are important internationally in, in multilateral negotiations like the European Women's Lobby have taken a position of condemning sex work um, and describing it as exclusively exploitative. Um, so, you know, that then makes it easy for conservative actors to kind of work on this sort of victim framing of, of women, which is convenient to all sides. Yeah. Um, another one is the anti-trans um, uh, kind of, or the, what, what's it called, the TERFs, yeah. the trans yeah. excluding radical feminists. Um, and, you know, it's very upsetting uh, to see at the CSW, um, meetings organized by the Heritage Foundation, which is an American um, group that's been described by the Southern Poverty Law Center as a hate group mm -hmm. because of its position on gay rights. Mm -hmm. um, so the Heritage Foundation in the same panel with um, feminists, people who self-describe as radical feminists, um, condemning um, trans rights, uh, trans activists, um, and so on. And so there's, there, there actually is very kind of clever picking off being done by some right wing groups of, of feminists. Um, and that undermines solidarity, to say the least. Um, uh, I don't know. And it, I, I just feel like we're, we're closing off possibilities and we need to find a way, some, some way to debate internally. And that's the great shame, really, that um, about, about the fact that multilateral forums are are less available than they used to be for this kind of thing. So I'm not saying that these problems weren't in Beijing, they were, and I'm not saying that they weren't debated in Beijing and they didn't divide us in Beijing, they did. Um, but it, it, is, it is almost inconceivable right now that one would seek another big global multilateral debate on women's rights, um, mainly because of the geopolitics um, problems that I've described but also because where where's the women's movement going to stand on some of these issues and where are our tools for resolving our differences? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's obviously um, something very important for us to strategize about and to think about. And sometimes I think uh, watching the next generation and how they've mobilized around climate change and things that we've got a lot to learn from them about how, how to overcome those differences. Because as you said, you know, the, these, these sort of intersections are not new by any means, but mm. um, but the closing down of, of well, civil spaces and international spaces, multilateral spaces are very problematic for us. Yeah, um, it makes me also want to look into, um, there are some really unexpected countries, well, maybe not unexpected, but some countries are making some interesting moves mm. on these very issues. So, um, the uh, Argentinian uh, women's ministry has renamed itself. It's called the, the Ministry of Women, Genders, and Diversity. Oh, wow. Awesome. How did they get there yeah. in a Catholic dominant country? Yeah, yeah, yeah. fascinating. Yeah. And our, uh, Uruguay, um, its entire social protection system was designed by academic feminists yeah. and is designed to you know, rethink unpaid care work. Okay, that's that's amazing. I mean, how did they get there? There are these incredible examples. And as you say, also, youth, climate, you know, there's there's um, lots and lots of good ideas out there and, and mobilizing energy. Mm. Um, and of course, I mean, it's not as if it's not as if feminists everywhere are are um, are sitting down and taking it because the street activism that we saw before COVID in the year and a half before COVID yeah. was phenomenal. You know, a democratic revolution in in um, South sorry in um, in Sudan and in Lebanon, the what's going on in Belarus. 
you know, the, 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 the revolution in Puerto Rico that got rid of the governor and tackled corruption. And that revolution was led by young, gay and trans women. Yeah, yeah. Amazing. I mean, this, this is so heartening, isn't it? Because we could just reflect on the now and think, you know, is this um, destroying that Beijing vision? Um, but but I think there are still there's still that energy and movement and yeah ways that we need to think in, uh, differently about about moving forward. Um, and so I'd like to finish on sort of a, a positive element. And there's one development that I think has been very encouraging, um, and that is this sort of um, arrival of feminist foreign policy and um, how that's an idea that seems to be being picked up and taken on um, Canada I I know now has taken taken that on as well as Sweden and other places and I just was wondering if you could reflect a little bit on how you see uh, that whether that sort of idea is is taking off more globally but also the sort of impact you think uh, the diplomatic um, developments could have on, on shaping the future agenda for women's rights um uh well i think the the whole concept of feminist foreign policy is a great development it's full of contradictions as we know and i'm not the first to point out that the arms trade uh especially sales of arms to Saudi Arabia makes it really tricky to say that you're practicing feminist foreign policy, which is why Mexico, which is practicing feminist foreign policy makes the most sense because I don't think they have an arms industry and if they do, they don't sell guns to um, Saudi Arabia. Right, yeah. Um, <laughs> but also Mexico is so important actually as part of this club because um, it, it recognizes that it has a massive problem on violence against women domestically, but you don't have to have a you know kind of like an, a, a perfect situation domestically to say you care about this in your foreign policy as yeah. well as domestically. Can um, I, just, I think um, it's a great development. Say there, Anne Marie. Just um, at the end of our day today, we've got a wonderful uh, poem that's called Mexico City, which is about the start of this whole movement, and we can't forget that it's been part of the story of women's rights since 19th. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I interrupted. But no, yeah. no, no, no problem. Um, so Mexico and France, whom uh, practice feminist foreign policy, are, are hosting the alternative to Beijing, of course, um, which should have been two smallish conferences. I mean, smallish by the standards of Beijing um, in Mexico City this past year, uh, 2020. And I believe this will uh, happen at some point next year, this generation equality process. Um, and so diplomatically, I think it's 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 really important what they're doing. They're they're challenging um, member, you know, their 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 other other countries to meet these standards, to commit, um, you know, to via diplomacy to commit to women's rights, to push the needle, to raise more money, and also to work with the private sector mm -hmm. on women's rights. So I think this is all very important. It's not the same as a agreement between 189 countries. Yeah. Um, I think I, we should keep an open mind actually about um, whether it might achieve um, important, um, you know, what, whether it might actually move things uh, on women's rights. I do think it's amazing the way, and very important the way they're focused on youth and this whole idea of a new generation mm -hmm. of feminists and women's rights and making it, um, again, this cultural thing, making it really cool to be a feminist. Um, which it of course is very cool. <laughs> <laughs> very cool. <laughs> but um, but yes, I, I guess I feel that you know th that um, that the the diplomatic space remains very important, um, where you can kind of challenge other states to meet standards. It's just that it's so rare that that ever happens. So Jamal Khashoggi gets chopped into pieces. Finally, countries protest about. Um, about Saudi Arabia, jailing of feminist activists for daring to drive. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and, you know, Canada and Sweden tweet about it and then they're cold shouldered by everyone. Um, you know, we got to actually use diplomacy to isolate these really kind of hostile states on women's rights. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Well, there's lots of work to be done, but it's it's wonderful to hear from you, um, you know, an insider's account of, of what has been going on there in those multilateral forums. They're still obviously hugely important for us and um, it's key to think about how we might better engage them and re-strategize and try to um, embed and institutionalize some of those developments that we've, we've made over time. But thank you, Anne-Marie, so much for our wonderful discussion today. I know everyone's going to be um, thrilled to hear from you and get your insights. So thank you so much. Great to talk to you. Yeah, and, and good luck with, um, you know, the next couple of months. It's tough going in the US there and coming into winter with COVID and uh, change of, of administration. There's, there's a lot to do and to think about, I'm sure, just in your own small worlds, micro worlds. So all the best for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So um, I really enjoyed having that conversation with Anne-Marie. I'm sorry, like Hillary, that I didn't know how to turn myself off the screen when I was doing that. And, um, We'll, we'll need to up my game for future uh, recordings. But it was uh, terrific to actually really get to the bottom of some of the complexities, I think, that we're ma managing around um, the rollback, the backlash, the, the pushback to women's rights um, more globally. And I should um, suggest that anyone interested in that, Anne-Marie's written a couple of recent papers that are really insightful um, on that particular issue and details and documents um, the various players and the sorts of tactics and the influence that um, conservative forces have played at the UN, but also some of the tactics that are being used against that to really challenge and make sure that um, some of the gains uh, remain in place, which is very important.